talking about Salah. Salah being a connection between you and Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Hajj, which is a 22nd Surah in Ayah 37, it is not their flesh and blood that reaches Him, but their taqwa that reaches Him. Now, although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this in respect to the sacrificial animals, it's not the blood that reaches Allah. What is it that reaches Allah is their taqwa, it's their devotion, it's their commitment to obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is this telling us? The most important thing is that inner dimension. It's that inner quality. Taqwa is an action of the heart. It's an action of worship of the heart. It's that quality, as we've explained previously, that gains control over the heart and disposes the heart or gives the heart the inclination to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one of the great scholars of the past, Sufyan al-Thawri, he said that without humility and awareness, one's prayer is invalid. And it's related that Al-Hasan, meaning Hasan al-Basri, he said that a prayer performed without conscious awareness is a shortcut to punishment. And according to Mu'ad ibn Jabal, a man gets no credit for a prayer which he deliberately notices those people on the left and on the right. And according to another authentic tradition, the Prophet wasallam said, Though he performs the prayer, a man may be credited with no more than a sixth or one-tenth of it. A man gets credit only for that part of his prayer of which he is conscious. Brothers, this is hadith of the Prophet wasallam. Sisters, this is a statement of the Prophet wasallam. Who wants to make all of that effort to say the prayer, to prepare oneself, to stand there in front of Allah, Yet you don't make the effort to be consciously aware, to have khushur, and then you only get rewarded for a small portion of the prayer that you have performed. So in reality, the scholars are agreed, brothers and sisters, according to the tradition of the Prophet wasallam, that a person only gets credit, they only get rewarded, they only actually really benefit from that part of the salah of which they are consciously aware. So let us take this matter very, very seriously. And the Prophet ﷺ, he gave us guidance on this matter and showed us through his own practice. And there's many, many examples of this. First of all, SubhanAllah, when one is feeling really, really tired and one is feeling really, really sleepy and you know, you can't keep your eyes open, the Prophet wasallam he said in hadith collected both in Bukhari and Muslim, if any one of you becomes drowsy while he is praying, let him sleep until he is refreshed. Because if any one of you prays while he is drowsy, he may not understand what he is saying. And he may not pray for forgiveness, but he may insult himself by mistake instead. Again, brothers and sisters, the point here, doesn't this show how important it is to understand what you're saying in your salah, to be aware of the meaning of the words, not to just say things that you have no idea what it means. No, this shows that you have to be aware, you have to be consciously aware. And also, you're sleepy, you're tired. Now don't force yourself to pray. I mean, here is the sleep that is the type of sleep and drowsiness that is going to overcome you. Okay? So then what it is better to do is take some time sleep and then approach the prayer when you are refreshed and you are subhanAllah ready to be conscious and aware of what you're saying. Again, what is this showing? The importance of conscious awareness, reverence, awe and focus in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another example is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, and this hadith is collected in Sahih al-Bukhari, it's narrated by Aisha. If the iqama for the prayer is proclaimed and the supper is served, take your supper first. SubhanAllah. Now we've heard about the virtues and the importance of praying in the mosque. We've even heard about the virtues of Isha, because this tends to happen around Isha time. So imagine you're hearing the iqama. The mu'addin has called you to the prayer. 
Now you're hearing iqamah. The people are standing for prayer, but the supper is there. It's hot, it's ready. What should you do? A lot of people probably would go running off to the mosque. But you know what would happen? They would be starting their prayer, and they'd be thinking about that beautiful plate of hot biryani and that beautiful curry and the chapatis and everything. And subhanAllah, well, if that's what you eat, mashallah. And you won't be thinking about Allah. You'll be thinking about how your dinner is getting cold and the beautiful tastes and the flavors. SubhanAllah. This shows how important khushu and attentiveness is in the prayer. No, first you eat. But the point being, it's primarily to do with how will you concentrate in your prayer while the food is ready. So again, it's showing this is the importance of focus, of attention, of having your mind concentrating on the prayer. Similarly, the Prophet Sallallahu he did not allow a person to pray while they are feeling this urge to relieve oneself and answer the call of nature. How do you know? You know when this urge is so great that it's distracting you in your prayer. If you're standing there thinking, oh, I need to go to the loo, I need to... You're not thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not concentrating in your prayer. You're just thinking that I need to go to the bathroom. I need to relieve myself. So then what should you do? The Prophet has ordered us, told us, relieve yourself first, then pray. Why? Because the awareness, the attentiveness, the khushur is what the prayer is about. It's not just about making the movements, brothers and sisters. It's not just about mouthing the words and exercising the tongue. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just, alhamdulillah, I, rahman, I, I don't know. I'm just making. This is not what the prayer is about. And these hadith are showing us, take care of these concerns so you can be focused and you can be attentive and you can understand what you are saying. Also, there are things that distract us our eyes looking around. We shouldn't be distracted. We shouldn't be looking around. So that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to order distracting things to be removed. For example, Bukhari reported that Anas is saying that Aisha had covered a part of her apartment with a drape. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, take it away because its figures keep distracting me from my salah. So there was this drape in the house, it had some figures on it, and the Prophet ﷺ said, take it away because it's distracting me from my salah. Showing how we shouldn't have things around us that are distracting us and not allowing us to focus entirely on worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why as well, brothers and sisters, we mentioned this before, that the Prophet ﷺ, he ordered simplicity in the masjids. It's dislike for there to be things around that would distract you. Even you find many of the scholars in the past disliking that a person should wear clothes with bright colors or with like images and you find a lot of that these days. I don't want to discourage the youth from coming to the masjid. MashaAllah, of course we don't want to discourage that. It's very important. But Subhanallah, people come with these clothes with super bright colors and shapes and designs and all of this can be very, very distracting for people in the prayer. And that's why the scholars of the past, they used to discourage those type of things so that people would not be put off and diverted from attentiveness in the prayer. Also, smells. Smells can be very distractive. So not only sights that distract us from our prayer, smells also. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that he would strongly condemn people who used to come to the masjid smelling of garlic and onions and leeks or any type of pungent smell. So Ibn Umar relates that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever eats from this plant, meaning garlic, should not approach our mosque. And this is collected in Bukhari and Muslim. Anas relates that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whoever eats from this plant should neither come close to us nor pray with us. Again, Sahil Bukhari. And there's many, many other narrations. There are skew narrations like this, my dear brothers and sisters. And this is all to do with the smell, as this is collected in Sahih Muslim, that anyone who eats them should kill the smell through cooking. So it is about the smell. 
Why should the person not come to the masjid having eaten garlic and onions? Why should they? Because the smell of it, the stink of it, is very, very disturbing. Subhanallah. So if this is the case, brothers and sisters, with garlic and onions, how about the revolting and disgusting stink of tobacco? And they come to the masjid stinking of this tobacco. It's so hard to even concentrate on your prayer with someone next to you like that. So subhanallah, all of this, brothers and sisters, is to help the musalli, help the people in the masjid, concentrate and focus on their as-salah. Also, the Prophet ﷺ prohibited people from passing one in front of the other. And the Prophet said, if the one who passes in front of a person who is praying knew the sin that he incurs, what is the sin? Because he's disturbing and distracting the person from their salah. He would realize it is better to wait for 40 than passing in front of him. And Abu Nadr said, I don't know whether he said 40 days or 40 months or years. Subhanallah. Imagine if it is years. The sin is so bad, it's better to wait for 40 years. Subhanallah. So brothers and sisters, this is very important. All of these indicate the importance of focusing and allowing this focus and nothing to distract us in our salah. And we will continue with this very, very important subject in our next episode. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah, Muhammadun Rasulullah.